let's acknowledge that they need some veteran talent. Now, whether they take Jalen Carter at number five, let's just say, or a quarterback, I think this idea is worth considering and has benefits for both things. You have got pick 20. You've got a pick in the early second round and you've got a pick in the late second round. Now, I freaking hate the idea of another crap veteran trade, but I'm going to suggest one anyway for the purpose of a conversation about this because nobody else has really talked about this and I want to, and I want to get your idea on it. I don't think this reading what has been said by the Washington commanders GM that Deron Payne is going to be allowed to hit the market. I think he's had two, he had a career year, 11.5 sacks, incredible for a defensive tackle. 18 TFLs, third most in the league. You cannot let a guy like that walk. He's 25. He's not 26 till, till later in this year. I think it's May or something. So they're going to franchise him for $18.9 million. But they've paid Jonathan Allen. They're going to have to pay Montez Sweat. And they may want to pay Chase Young if he can get healthy again. Um, they're going to cut Carson Wentz, which would free up the money to re-sign Deron Payne. But at the same time, I think all options have to be open. And based on what Deron Payne's been saying, he just wants to get paid. And I don't think he gives a crap about staying in Washington. Jonathan Allen signed there because he's from Washington. He lives down the road from the stadium. So a bit different. Would you consider trading if he is franchised for Deron Payne? It'd be expensive. It might be your first pick in round two, for example, to go and get him. But would you do it? Because what you do get then is a veteran, proven sack specialist, tackle for a loss specialist, fits the scheme, hard-nosed, explosive, quick defender on a 4.90 at 310 pounds. You get him in at a great age. You could sign into a four-year contract. He'll be 30 when that runs out. There's a chance for a third contract there if you wanted to. Imagine having Jalen Carter and Deron Payne on your defensive line next year. That's a front three. That is something that can scare opponents. Jalen Carter on his own, or next to Shelby Harris and Al Wood, seems underwhelming to me. It seems like, you know, you're you're not you're putting a band aid on a on a on a on a gunshot wound. Really, I think it's it's you need a bit more than that. Put Payne and Carter together; it's very good. But if you take a quarterback at five, Jeff, it also means that you aren't missing out on some impact defenders up front. So if you take your quarterback and then you get Deron Payne at the top of round two, let's say with your high second round pick, you have got a, a good, young, quality defensive lineman and you've got your quarterback of the future. You'd have to pay Deron Payne $20 million a year. But hey, you're paying Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs near enough $20 million a year. So I don't know. What do you think? Again, I don't like the idea of big veteran trades because we the scars from Graham and Harvin and Adams are there. But what do you make of this suggestion? Well, you just made my point. Um, the thing I've been saying for years is if you're going to trade for players from other teams, get them at the line of scrimmage. Like the one thing that's been bothering me, you mentioned all three of them. Graham was a tight end that couldn't block. Percy Arvin was a gadget player. And Jamal Adams is essentially a gadget player on defense. If you look at some of the big defensive players that have been traded, like Von Miller, what he did for the Rams last year. If I can get Jerron Payne in the second round pick, I would do it. I know there's people who would go crazy about that because of the cost of what a second round pick would cost for the next four years versus giving that up and paying them. But to me, those defensive linemen are as rare to find as quarterbacks. And we've seen it almost throughout this entire regime. They haven't had a lot of guys like this, like, Getting Averill and Ben in free agency was so lucky, and the prices they got were so unbelievable. But Jerron Payne's a 25-year-old stud in the middle of the defensive line. And, and I think the cool thing was it's exactly what you said. It, it opens up a lot of luxury and flexibility with that pick five. And if you end up with Jalen Carter, you've now created a massive position of strength at your biggest weak spot. And I just think players like Jerron Payne are super rare and – they don't hit free agency, and if they franchise tag them, you see the drop off in quality and talent. These big defensive tackles, and you look at like DJ Reader's a guy that done really well in Cincinnati, and that's the kind of player we've been saying Seattle's been needing to sign. And those are the kind of players I actually would feel comfortable trading for. Like the Giants traded for Leonard Williams a few years ago. I think it was a third round pick. 
they gave him. They paid him $20 million a year or something. And, like, everyone talks about Brian Dable, and rightfully so, but they have three top 20 picks in their defensive line. Dexter Lawrence, Leonard Williams, and Thibodeau. Or Thibodeau. Um, that makes a huge difference. Seattle doesn't have one player drafted in the top 15 on their team other than Bruce Irvin, who's 35 and probably shouldn't be playing at this point in his career. So, yeah, he's a guy I would trade for. I know some people would absolutely hate that just because of the cost difference and just drafting a guy in the second round. But to me, guys like that are hard to find. They're rare, and they can change your ceiling. And they have so much other draft capital, I think I'd be okay with that because they still have two ones, a two, and you can still move down some of those spots to recoup some of those picks. So if you move down from 20 after that, for example, maybe get a second back. So I am very, very – or move down from five. You could get a future one potentially. So I would do that very quickly. I just – the ideal scenario would be to be able to sign him. But I just think guys like that, you can't just plug in rookies at defensive line. You see it with Cincinnati. You've seen it in Buffalo. You've seen it in Kansas City. They trade for Frank Clark. They won the Super Bowl the next year. They paid Chris Jones. Like It took Chris Jones a couple of years. Uh, San Francisco, they've, they've been able to get guys left and right. But all these teams, the Giants, you saw their defensive line. It's That's the position group I would be comfortable trading for especially defensive tackle that's kind of Alabama, like blue collar. Like that's a guy that's just so hard to get. And to me, I would do that trade. I just think if you, that whenever the league year opens, you see a tweet from Schefter or Rappaport or whoever Seahawks have traded number 38, I think it is, or whatever, um, for Deron Payne. I'm getting a cigar out, putting my feet up, looking around, looking forward to that number five pick because you can't go wrong. Because either way, you're going to win. If Jalen Carter or Will Anderson are there at number five, great. You've just set up um, two stud players for your defensive front. Um, if those players are gone, or if you prefer to take a quarterback, you've got your quarterback for the future, and you've got a stud defensive lineman. You can't lose. Like it just it takes all the pressure off the draft before you've even got. You know, you're you're still nearly two months away from the draft. And you've sold, or just about six weeks away from the draft, and already you've put a great big tick in one box by getting a proven quality defensive lineman at a good age. For me, it's it's a win-win, and and I'd seriously consider it. And look, I'm going to produce a mock draft um, tomorrow because I've been promising one for a few weeks, and I kept delaying it and delaying it because I either wasn't happy with the darn thing, or I was waiting for something to to materialise, like CJ Stroud declaring or the Seahawks season finishing. And I'll, I'll give a bit of a spoiler alert, Jeff, that I, you know, I'll, I'm going to put a linebacker at Drew Sanders at number 20. And the reason is, is because I think that, you know, when I was listening to Carol the other day, he was saying they, you know, they need impact. They need players who can get, you know, aggressive, attack-minded players. And the one thing about Drew Sanders is he's a very good athlete. He's got good size and he can get bigger. He's six foot five, 230. He could probably get to play at 240. Very quick, flies to the ball carrier. He had nine and a half sacks last year and he can play conventional linebacker and he did for Arkansas but he can play off the edge on in sub packages and stuff like that a bit like a poor man's Micah Parsons so I was thinking okay you know you put if if you did go Carter five you've then got Carter Payne and Sanders who were like all of a sudden you're going into a game thinking we could get after a team and if and if it's not Carter and if it's a quarterback you think okay you've got Payne you've got Sanders and like what else can you add you know where can you go and get a defensive lineman with your second second round pick or a third round pick you know there are some very athletic dynamic you know th- five technique three technique types that are going to be in this draft you, you all of a sudden you're building a team that you can think yeah do you know what this is building off that 2021 2022 draft this is this is the second phase of this and you either come out of it jeff with a great d line for the future and you feel good about that or you come out of it with an improved d line and a quarterback Tell me that doesn't sound good. I mean, that, that sounds good, doesn't it? That's Every single fan who is a Seahawks fan should be able to say either of those scenarios, I'm down with that, I think. It's 100%. And you watch this team, they they have, like, the speed and the flash, which is funny, we've talked about for years, but they don't have, like, the guts. They don't have the guts of this team. Their weakness is the line of scrimmage on both sides, the interior of the line. they got the two tackles who are more pass blocking, but they don't have those dominant physical guys 
and they don't have like their best defensive linemen are probably Al Woods and Shelby Harris. And those are complimentary players at best. So nothing against those guys. Those guys are playing really, really well, but they're not building blocks. And to go into a situation where you could add three building blocks and guys at the right, and what I like about Payne too, he's the right age. He's ascending, he's getting better. And that's like the sweet spot for defensive line. That's when you're playing your best football. It's not like running back where they fall off a cliff right after that age point. Um, that's exactly when they've had their man strength. And man, it would be just the, that's the thing I keep saying, like, you're not going to build a defense like San Francisco. It's just probably not realistic. You're not going to build what they had in the first three, five years of this program. You're not going to hit, you're not going to get eight pro bowlers on a defense in the next two years. What you have to do is you have to create positions of strength that matter. And you have to be able to go up and try to defend your opponents. Their defense in that San Francisco game was abysmal. They couldn't, Stop the run all season. They couldn't tackle a lot of the season. And uh, I love the idea. Like I said, I love the idea of getting linebackers that could run and hit. Like they're going to need to – you saw them try to play Debo Samuel. and You saw them play San Francisco three times. They're just out physical. Can't tackle. You saw them in that Carolina game against a physical team. And they got run over and they were pretty embarrassed. And I think that's what you can build. And again, I don't think you can just purely do it with draft picks. And I think you need veterans. And if Jerron Payne's the only way to get him as a trade, I think that makes your team so much better. And I'm all for it. I think that would be a very exciting offseason. It would. It, it would be. And the only other name I wanted to throw your way, Jeff, I was reading this slightly comical article on NBC Chicago, uh, which was suggesting that um, I think this was, we put this in the two plus two equals five category. They were suggesting that the Bears would be able to trade for DeForest Buckner because Matt Eberflus was the coach at Indianapolis and that that would be a great reunion. And I read that they were hoping that they would it, it could, they could maybe nick him for a third-round pick. And I was thinking, yeah, yeah, maybe maybe the Rams will give you Aaron Donald for a fourth as well. Uh, I mean, there are not there are not many. This is the thing. If you actually go on PFF, there are not many highly graded defensive tackles or interior defensive linemen in the league. There's a very small selection of those who are graded in like the 80s and the 90s, of which DeForest Buckner has consistently been one of them over the last few years. But the one thing I wanted to say is the only way I think he might be available, and he won't be available for a third, but maybe if, if we're talking about that second round, the one thing that made me sort of just think about it from a Seattle point of view, Jeff, if the Colts, the Colts are under a lot of pressure. You know, Chris Ballard did a press conference and he was asked over and over again, at, are you going to trade up? Are you going to trade up from four? Are you going to go and get the best quarterback? Are you going to go? There's immense pressure on him to get the best quarterback of this draft or who his guy, essentially, because for years it's been Philip Rivers, Jacoby Brissett, uh, Carson Wentz, Matt Ryan, and the fans are sick of this. They want a good young quarterback. Now, they can get one at four, presumably, but what if they see a two-quarterback draft and they're both gone? You know what they're going to do? They're going to draft a defender? You know, like they've got to, maybe they've got to trade up. And the, the Colts do not have a third round pick um, because they're giving it away. So they need a bit more stock in order to be able to confidently move up to Chicago. Would they be willing to sacrifice the Forrest Buckner to get draft stock to help them go from four to one, let's say? And would that appeal to the Bears if there's a bit more stock thrown in? Because then they stay in the top four rather than, say, trading to ninth with Carolina, I do think there is some benefit to Chicago if they're going defense to saying we want to go and step, we want to make sure we get Will Anderson or Jalen Carter, let's say. So I just wonder whether the Colts might be willing to sacrifice somebody there to, to make that deal. And who knows? I mean, I, the Forest Button is 29 this year, so he's, he's a bit older. But again, I listened to Pete Cowell, Jeff, talk about how much they needed impact and factors up front. And you are not going to get impact and factors from rookies, even with the fifth overall pick, not in the first year. And you're not going to get impact and factors by cheap and cheerful free agents. You need blue chip players. And I just get the sense that they're going to have to, they, they will feel massive pressure. They've been here before, you know, 2019. We've got to fix the pass rush. We've got to fix the pass rush. That amounted to trading Frank Clark and drafting LJ Collier. And the year after it was, we're going to try and keep Jadavian Clowney. And then, oh, we've not done that. So it's Bruce Irvin and Benson Miewa. So they've flopped on this before. But 
the way that he spoke so negatively about what this team doesn't have, it makes me feel they've got to go and do something, Jeff. And, and they're the only two. I had a look across every depth chart. They're the only two that fit the bill for me, either DeForest Buckner and Deron Payne. Don't know if they'll be available. Don't know what's going to happen with them. But they're the only two that I can make an argument for. What do you think? I think you're right on the money. Uh, I got a close friend that's a very big Colts fan in Toronto. And I've probably talked more Colts than I probably should have, considering how boring they've been. So I'm pretty tied into what's going on there. And the one thing he's been telling me for a while now is he's been wondering if they've been if they were going to cut or get rid of Buckner because they're in a bad they're oh, a bad. Yeah. I don't think they'll cut him, but oh, wow. let me look at his numbers here. He has no he's got no dead money left on his contract, so it would clear out twenty million dollars. And if they're at a point where they acknowledge they're rebuilding and they do have a lot of needs, they don't have a left tackle. But- Sorry to interrupt, Jeff. Yeah, they have five. I didn't realize this. They've got five million dollars of effective cap space. Now, I'll have a look while you're speaking to see if there's some easy outs. I suspect people like Matt Ryan will provide that. But um, so if they cut Matt Ryan, it's seventeen. It's, it's an eighteen million dollar dead cap hit. Uh, but they still they will save seventeen million. And the only other viable one is Buckner, who they saved twenty million from. Yeah. So he's been putting it that scenario to me for a while. I don't think they would cut him outright. I think they'd probably trade him because they probably would be a trade market. But if they're at the point where they determine, okay, they're going to draft the quarterback, they're not in a win-now window with basically, if you get C.J. Stroud there, I don't think that team is all of a sudden a Super Bowl contender. They might say, okay, maybe we spend that money on offensive players. They have a shortage of receiver. They trade away a pick for Wentz, and they're going to have to trade. to move. They're, they're the obvious trade. They're the mark. Because exactly what you said, Chris Ballard's on the hot seat. Jim Mercedes kind of lost it in the last year. And there's that Bucker contract sitting there and zero dead money. So it's an easy cut. It's an easy trade. And yeah, like me and you have been so critical of how they've handled this defensive line group for so long. And I'm glad it seems like they finally come to their senses. They've said this before and had idiotic offseason plans. But for years, we've been saying they have no vision. They're tying this together with Band-Aids, which is why I like their last offseason because it actually made sense. All their three of their first four picks went to offense. Now it's defense that needs the help. And again, if Buckner becomes available and you can redo his deal, which would drop that cap hit, that's a great opportunity that fits exactly where they are as a team. And I think it's exactly what you said. The Colts are the mark for the trade-up. Unless they look. Drafting a quarterback is not like drafting a defensive tackle. This guy is the face of your franchise. Like, you see what happened with the Jets and Zach Wilson. That OC just got fired because they whiffed. You got a lot of the scouting on quarterbacks happens now. Like, this guy, you have to love everything about him. So the Colts can't just sit there and say, oh, we love three quarterbacks. They're going to need to be aggressive. I know they jumped the Seahawks in the draft. That helps a bit, but they can't just sit there for. They, they are likely going to have to move, especially Houston in their division would probably love to block them. So I see Buckner as a prime trade candidate. I don't know what it would cost, but he's 29, not 25 like Payne. So I think that does drop the price point a bit. He's a different kind. He's not like the nasty road grader that Payne is. He's more of like a long disruptor. He's like, he can get it, blow up a play very quickly. If you remember how Clowney used to blow up run plays, that's what Buckner can do, and he's a better pass rusher than Payne. So Buckner would be a really interesting guy. He just he might not fit the timeline of the team if they're putting in a rookie quarterback. So that's where the I've been wondering about him as well. A lot of people have been looking at the Bears, but I think you're right. I think the Colts would love to stockpile more assets. They're going to want to move, and they, they have a lot of areas of need. And Chris Ballard is not in this thing where he can mess around. This is – he doesn't get this right. He's probably going to get released in the next year or two. Well, I have to apologize to NBC uh, Chicago because I had no idea that the, you know, I'm glad you've, you've sort of set the record straight there, Jeff, because I had no idea that the Colts were in this kind of financial quandary. And, you know, it, it's far from the worst one. But um, do you know what it reminds me a little bit of? I can't remember how old he was, but I can remember when Calais Campbell went from Jacksonville. He'd, he'd had a really good season at Jacksonville. He was about 30, 31 at the time. And I can remember writing articles saying, trade for Calais Campbell, bring him to Seattle. You know, he's got a few years, you're in win-now mode, um, go and get him. And we were talking back then at like maybe 
third round picks, late seconds. For, and then and then I can remember I was driving somewhere. Uh, I was in the passenger seat. My wife was driving. And it buzzed up that the Ravens had traded like a fifth round pick for Calais Campbell. And I was like, it cost a fifth? Like, it, it, that's it? And you, and maybe I'm just misjudging the, the book, the situation. Maybe you could get him for a, a mid-round pick just to, so they can make that saving and move on and maybe just get that extra stock so that they can try and trade up. 